Hey folks, before we get this episode started, I just want to throw a little disclaimer in there. We had some technical difficulties on our end, Barn Talk. It's just Dad and I running the show and we're interviewing the guests and we have nobody back running the cameras, checking on our equipment. So halfway through this episode, one of our camera angles went out and it went out on our guest. So bear with us. We're getting, we're going to get, get this issue solved, try to not have it happen again and enjoy the episode. Thanks for being patient with us. All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays at the barn until now. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today, we have a special ep- special episode. We're going to solve some problems and talk about some opportunities to solve some more problems. Uh, as you all know, we love technology and disruption, and we love agriculture, and we're going to talk about those two things, those three things today. Uh, our guest today embodies both of these qualities and is using them to change a livestock livestock industry uh, for the better. So dad's got the market update, but before he gets into that, all I ask for you guys is to pay the fee and share the show, share it out to your friends, share it out to your family, share it out to your coworkers. We're trying to grow this thing, trying to do some good in this world. And it's just kind of a value exchange. So share the show for us. We'd really appreciate it. We do appreciate that. I'm not getting any younger, so we got to get this thing going. So uh, harvest is winding down in Southeast Iowa. We're just about done. We've got about one day left. We're going to actually, we're gonna actually uh, try to finish up today and tomorrow, and then we'll have everything done. Um, yields around here have been excellent. I raised the best corn on corn this year that I ever have. Um, and so you should feel real good about that. And I've even sold some corn uh, thanks to the plethora of hog feeders in Washington County. The basis has been excellent, so I've been selling as I go a little bit. Um, but there is a lot of uncertainty. If you've heard, nitrogen is about a dollar a unit right now. And so uh, this is not financial advice, but I sure as hell would not prepay my nitrogen because you have no advantage of doing that. Um the, the last time this happened, it broke in the spring and went down. So if you prepaid, you kind of got screwed. So basically, I'm planning on not prepaying any nitrogen and then hoping that it's lower in the spring. Thank God for hog manure. Yes, hog manure is like, is like gold this year. So we just had the conversation if we were going to plant any beans. or Because we, we, uh, we actually let some of our manure go down the road to neighbors that haul it. Um, and I told Sawyer, maybe we should just plant corn on corn on everything and just use all that manure. So we're hoping that all of you guys got to pay for nitrogen, and just plant beans because <laughs> you don't want to spend that much money. And then the corn price will just be just as good as it is this year. Yeah. And I'm sure what'll happen is it'll, that price will collapse in the spring and then we'll have, have we'll be like, corn. damn it, we should have planted beans. Yeah. But anyway, we'll figure it out one way or another. Uh, so your market update today, uh, And this is the close yesterday. And so last I checked, um, corn and beans were still down a little bit, but they very well, they were getting narrower when I saw them. So this is courtesy of Cat's Grain in Washington, Iowa. This is their uh, cash prices. Corn's 524 and 552. That was local and 552 at ADM and Cedar Rapids if you want to go fight that fight. Um, Soybeans, 1228, and that's at Cedar Rapids or Quincy. And hogs, 76. Um, cattle 125. I keep giving you a cattle price that never changes. 125. Bitcoin though, holy mother Mary. So um, a Bitcoin ETF came out this week, and apparently people like it. Uh, last I checked, Bitcoin was right around 65,000. To the moon. So if you're Tesla and you caught a bunch of shade for buying Bitcoin, uh, they're up about a billion and a half dollars. And yep. Michael Saylor from MicroStrategies. He decided he was going to take his company, Treasury, and just buy Bitcoin exclusively. How long ago? About a year and a half, two years ago? Yeah, I think that? he started when it was about, I want to say maybe 12000 15000 something like that. And I think it, pro- I don't know if it dipped any time that he bought, but anyway, um, they've been converting it ever since. They're up like, they're, $2 billion. they're like up $2 billion. I think he's bought it at like $4 billion, four billion, 4.7. He bought two and then- point something and it's worth four point something. So yeah, he's feeling pretty smart right now. 
Um, Ethereum's 4,200. So it's kind of tagging along. Um, Tesla had earnings yesterday. So any of you that are new to the show, uh, Tesla is kind of near and dear to my heart. That I has like a boner to, for Tesla. I always kind of brag on them. Uh, they had earnings yesterday and they crushed it. Um, their gross margin without regulatory credits because they get some free money for all the people that are, uh, air quotes, polluting the planet and they have to buy uh, carbon credits. Everyone always, I always see comments. The government bailed Elon out. That's the only way they make money. Yep. Yep. They, the only way and they hey, money. you know what? If I could get some of Sleepy Joe's money to bail me out, I'd get it because I'm not sure if he'd remember tomorrow well, that he gave it to me. So that's I'm all about far, getting that's it. That's the farmer talking. In well, you. That's right. You know why farmers uh, fold the bill on their hat? It's so that when they go to the mailbox and the sunshine and it cuts the glare so you can see all the way to the back, make sure you didn't miss any any government checks that are in there. <laughs> Takes the shade wow. out. Never heard that one. Yep, that's, that's what it's for. All right. Anyway, uh, their gross margin was about 29%, which is crazy for the auto business. Uh, they got about $16 billion in cash and they paid off $1.8 billion in debt. I think they only have about $2 billion in debt and they're sitting on $16 billion. For all of those that think that they're going to go tits up, I, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they're going to make it. Anyway, that was the long and short of it because it's cold. If you notice, it's a little chilly in the morning. We're bundled we went, up today. We're, Absolutely. we're bundled up. And if our guest at any point, we'll try to fix it in post-production, but if he looks blue, uh, he's really not, he doesn't have a circulation problem. It's just cold in the barn is what it can, comes down to. He's not nervous either if he's shivering. Yeah. He's just he's just cold. Well, he's excited. Yeah. <laughs> he's excited. Um, so we're, we've, had a, we've had some really good guests on lately, and this one falls right in there because this is kind of a unique relationship. Uh, I think we always say it was fate that we met because, um, so Michael Hansen is our guest today and he, he is with a company. He started a company called Barn Tools and one of their products is actually Barn Talk. And ironic. Ironic. It wasn't planned. It was not it, yeah. planned. So we, we were just totally out there. Um, we hatched this idea that we were going to do this podcast. And right around the time we started, maybe we had like one episode out. And yeah. We got an email. We got a LinkedIn message, yeah. I think. Yep. And um, that is kind of how we started down the road. And even more ironic was that they're actually in a business that is definitely tailored to a problem that we have and that we had, and we actually solved that problem using their product. So we, we have, uh, we've been going back and forth for quite a while, and um, Michael's a really interesting guy, and he is, he's kind of at the forefront of what I would say is the transition in the, in the animal agriculture business to data in the cloud, and we'll get into this, but the way we've traditionally manage sites and manage barns um and the way we're headed to um we're kind of at a we're kind of at a crossroads and so we're going to get into that and um it should be a it should be a good conversation so welcome michael welcome michael welcome to barn talk thank you for having me <laughs> <laughs> i like it I mean, first time at the barn yep i got a rack of uh all sorts of whiskey staring at me. Is yep. Yes. A little early or? Well, yeah. it depends. I'm not going to tell you what's I'll, in my tumbler. Yeah. I'll probably crack a beer here sometime. I know we shoot these in the morning. We'd like to shoot them at night sometime, but. We could always say we're shooting at night right now. Yeah, that's Spare right. Spare the judge. We, we're going to get a bar eventually. We yeah, just we're going to. We just got to get it. a few more subscribers. Wink, we, wink. We were going to, we were going to vinyl wrap the barn in blue just for your arrival, um, but we just ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. We thought it would really look good, wrapped in blue, it said barn talk on it. But hey, We can paint the roof <sighs> your finishing barns too, I feel like. Yeah. Free advertising. <laughs> right. right. Well, don't put it past us because, you know, we're anything for a anything for, for, for some dime. sponsorship money. Yep. So anyway, um, so to start, you, you like us, you've grown up in animal agriculture. And so this isn't your only endeavor as far as being involved in the livestock industry. Why don't you give us a little... 10,000 foot view of how, how you got involved in, uh, the livestock business. And more importantly, what was the, what was the, the evolution of thought that brought to starting barn tools? Well, that's a wide open one. Yeah. Right? Oh boy. Sure. So 
Where to begin? Um, so my dad is a fifth generation farmer, I believe, grew up in north central Iowa and uh, raised hogs, uh, beans, corn, et cetera, and, and started, uh, thought, hey, you know, this hog business, is, something's happening here, and started building equipment and then eventually got into raising hogs, and uh, that took off, and we're now the largest hog producer in Iowa. And so I've just grown up watching him being around, uh, kind of just by osmosis, absorbing Absorbing info, yeah. But yet he's still old school and a farmer, so I've done my time in the trenches, uh, you know, worked on the farms, managed the sow farm, uh, got my hands dirty because that's his way. And yep. you know, But I can appreciate that because now I can sit here and, and know what the hell's going on and what right. people are talking about. So I've just... That's, you know, that's been my life. My domain experience has been, it's really been swine, yeah, right? Right. And, and I've seen it from, you know, from ground level all the way high up. And so, but I've always had a passion for technology too. Yep. Okay. So you, you got this passion and this domain experience and growing up with the internet, I, I had a computer, I want to say in like first grade, watched a little AOL guy try to make it to the third box across the yep. street the screen and, and, uh, had my buddy list and, you know, technology was, the internet was just yep. taken off. And so the, the timing was there and, um, and these two paths are finally, uh, converging, uh, quick side story, uh, just with technology. When I was in sixth grade, my sister was in ninth, her boyfriend broke up with her thought he was a dick <laughs> I, could, I could say on the record That's a good brother yeah and so i uh, i put a trojan virus on his computer now being in sixth grade <laughs> i wasn't smart enough to wait so i mean i had to sell the story to get him to take the file right but like a minute and a half later i was already you know pressing buttons screwing with stuff yep and uh, completely wiped his computer, and it wasn't hard to figure out. I opened a file, and a minute later, everything's haywire. I probably should have gave it a week, but... Yep, you yep. Know, you learn. You hadn't yeah. learned your tactfulness yeah. yet at that yeah. point. I still don't have patience, but... That's a good brother right there. Yeah, she, uh, yeah it cost or, me. She was, she was older than you. She was. So you had you were you weren't you weren't ready to square up with them yet. So you had to get... Uh, you had to use your wits. I got height, but man, I never got muscle, so... <laughs> uh, yeah... I, that one cost me, but okay. So, so there's always, I don't know. That's just, I've always loved computers technology and, and now it's coming together. I think any kid that grew up, uh, and this is true for anybody, whether your dad raised cattle or chickens or whatever. But for me, when you were out there and you were in the sow unit or you were loading pigs or you were doing whatever, we all have the thought. I still have this thought today. I know Sawyer has this thought you're like, gosh, dang, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. There's got to be a better way. Yeah. And I feel like adoption, part of the reason I feel like that farmers are as productive as they are is because so much of what they do that is labor driven, they all have that, they all have that thought where they're standing there in the thick of it and they're like, man, there's got to be a better way. Until you're in your combine and everything goes to hell because a mouse ate one wire, then you're not so sold on technology. <laughs> right up to there, you're like, man, there's got to be a better way. Right. And the labor challenges are only getting worse. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's, I mean, it's hard to, it, labor's terrible. I mean, and then you, you look and there's, I mean, recently, and maybe it's COVID related, I, I don't know, but now there's a daycare shortage and it just seems to compound, right? Yep. So you were, so you were kind of working in sow farms, doing that whole thing under your dad's kind of deal, learning the ropes and everything, getting the hog business. So when did you kind of say, I'm ready to go after this tech thing and do something? Yeah. So his, so do something different. So his, I think maybe his idea was learn all aspects of the business or all phases of production. Yeah. Yep. And, and so I did that. Um, I, man, I might go off on a couple bunny trails here, but You're fine. Uh, so, so then progressed out of production and worked in construction and spent some time there. And, and I got to say, Another skill set that's been pretty valuable. Absolutely. Uh, I could tell you the workings of a hog barn, you know, and I, I could build you a hog barn to this day and 
and uh, it, that that was a whole. No- I've I've always watched like you got you got the guys who are the production guys, yep. you, you got the maintenance guys and all that. I mean, Torque, you worked at PSI, yep. right? And and yep. if you if you can have both, man, yep. it arms you're ahead you. of the game. Yeah, it, it arms you real well. Not only that, but if you can work on a construction crew, the cultural the cultural side of that. I always said that uh, when I was doing when I was doing actual construction, I would have worked there for free just for the stories because <laughs> the people that you meet, the guys that that do that, kudos to them because that's a tough job. But I'll tell you what, there's some life experiences there that you're not going to get in corporate America. <laughs> oh, and, and trying to uh, balance two contractors pointing fingers at each other, you know, you got hundred percent. You got the framer pissed, the slats aren't set, and the slats aren't set because the concrete's not cured or, or even poor. It's the wall's just, crooked. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that wall's crooked. <laughs> and then, and then I've even seen it get down to well, I'll hang the heater, but you're plumbing it. But I'm only I'll hook up the bottom part, and you got to yeah. Yep, I'm not touching that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not touching That's that. That's a change order. They always blame yeah. it on the guy that did the job before they came. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Concrete guy brings br- blames a dirt guy. Yeah, carpenters blame the car the yep. concrete. How guy. am I supposed to frame on this? Yeah. It's crooked. As hell. Yeah, yeah. That's how it goes. So, so to answer your question, uh, you know how how did this whole tech thing come about? What well, well, I got to tell you that before the tech thing and this construction happened, I had a Chinese foreign exchange student live with me in high school. He's six six like I am, so I'm like scratching my head. Okay, uh, did my dad ever go to China? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is weird. Uh, and, and so we became, you know, great friends ever since. And then started to import hog gates and then build hog gates eventually in China. And uh, to anyone out there watching, don't ever do that because building hog gates is shitty margins, oh. and it's just a race to the bottom. And and so did that for a couple of years. Imported quite a bit of uh, manufactured hog equipment that we made ourselves. I still do a little bit of that today, but it was looking like there's got to be a pivot here yep. too. And so uh, the technology piece, uh, well, it was it was maybe, I, I, when I talk to customers, I don't give them the whole background, but, sure. but here we are. So the technology piece probably was spurred by just being in, shitty hog equipment business yep. and, and tired of it too and custom and I, okay it's galvanized but i'm really not going to pay you that much more for galvanized equipment blah blah, blah. it's like please just fight in the fight you gotta know what you want to do with by doing a bunch of stuff you don't want to do it, yeah <laughs> and i didn't want to build hog gates yeah forever. Yep, figured that out but i think you know so at, we experienced uh, i guess a pivotal moment was we experienced uh, some alarm calls that didn't go well, uh, should have called, I should say lack of alarm calls, yep. uh, some death loss and, and, and so on. And you look at these barns and they're built with closed circuit controllers. They're not talking out. I mean, yep. even if we put a $30,000 controller in majority of them aren't connected. Uh, and, and so these barns are like, archaic yet i'm controlling my nest thermostat from my house on my phone while i'm at work and so uh those those catastrophic events or or those those times we experienced those alarm calls uh made me scratch my head and say there's got to be a better way Mm -hmm. and so uh you know leveraging the supply chain we had in in asia and and some of that and you know electronics are made all over so uh, all over asia and so we've we used those um, strengths that we had with the supply chain uh looked at let's what is something we can give the farmer today in their hand because i can sit here i could sit here and talk big data ai all the cool sexy things mm-hmm. you know? but i'm not going to go to a farmer and say hey if we could put a hundred fifty thousand dollar you know equipment whatever SaaS product yeah. that you can pipe data to if you can get the data to it and do some predictive analytics uh, and all he heard was $150,000 yeah, and gotta went, be, I got someplace I need gotta to be. It's got to be affordable. It's got to be easy to use. It's got to be easy to set up. I, I feel like that's in our marketing. I should yeah. ask Greg about that. But <laughs> I feel like that's, that's in our marketing. It's, yeah. uh, sometimes we say farmer affordable. Uh, yep. And so we focused on a niche. Uh, just something, not try to be everything, be good at one thing. That took a little self-convincing because I'm like, we can do it all. But sure. uh, 
But we focused on the alarm system and said, okay, there's, we can improve this greatly. But at doing so, we realized that, man, this is so much more than an alarm system. This could be the vehicle to take data out of the farm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you have all back to those closed circuit controllers and no connectivity. And if we provide an alarm system that has, is, has connectivity embedded, right? It's self-contained, talks to the, to the internet by itself. Uh, if we could start with the alarm and focus, because that's something tangible in the farmer's hands. And but, the most important. I mean, that's yeah. the most important aspect of a farm. Right. As you know, because... Protect your inventory. Right. Et cetera. And so, it, but it's like the beginning or the platform to start collecting and connecting these farms and sending data. Yeah. And I feel like that right there, and we've talked about this before, I feel that like that's a pivotal spot where we are today, at least in the swine business, because we have been marketed to the idea. Um, so years ago, we had a control, which was nothing more than a thermostat. All it did was your fans, your heaters, everything was hooked up to a glorified thermostat. If it got this far above, it turned it on. If it got this far below, it turned it off. And then we, we made the transition because people the link between animal health and environment got stronger. And so people wanted more information as far as what was the high and what was the low and what was the humidity and how long it was and what time of day did we hit the high and, and how much water were we using and all that. But the, the issue was, and it still is today, we have gone the way of what, for lack of a better word, we'll say smart controls. And that's heavily marketed where we have a controller within the barn that accumulates a bunch of data. Okay. It, it is getting that. But the mechanism to get that data to where you can actually use it is not very good. And I'll give you an well, example. Well, it's not even there because you can't, you can't even see what's on the controller right. unless you're there. There's no interface between that smart control and you, where you can physically see it instantaneously. And I'll give you an example of how the infancy of that worked. So um, a lot of production companies, they would, they would want a smart control, but then they would have the grower hand record information off of that control. What was the high? What was the low? Still how, have. And still yeah. have. And then those paper forms were collected by a fieldman and sent back to the office. And I'll be honest, I bet you a lot of systems... They went in a file, and nobody even used that data. However, we were collecting it. Some of them did use it, but then they're paying somebody to take a paper form and convert it back to digital data when the digital data is there. We just couldn't get it. So today, and this is where I feel like you guys are, are right in the, in the midst of it, and it can be so much more in the fact that the data on your system is collected at the barn, but I can see it instantaneously, and I can use that data right off my handheld device. And that's that's a dip, you know, that's a different from where we have been. Did you always? So when you started, you said that your alarm alarms are your focus. Did you like that was your why, and that's what you wanted to do? And then once you did it, then then did you realize, wow, this could be so much more than just an alarm system? Or did you kind of have that like in the back of your mind when you first started it? Yeah, I, w I would say like, so I don't know if I ever said alarms or my, fo like I didn't go, Ooh, let's focus on alarms, yeah. but, but we knew we had a focus somewhere. I, I think the precursor to that was something around like, let's make these barns into smart barns. Well, at, the like, at the very least, let's bring some visibility to the barns and do so by you know, bringing data out, show some real, even if it's just real time temperature, you know, reading water every 20 minutes, seeing, just seeing what's going on, mm -hmm. let's put eyes on the barn. Right. And so then where do you start? Well, I'm not going to build a $40,000 controller. One, a oh, second, I don't want to mess with wiring, right? Yep. Yep. And, and why put all this money into this hardware you mount on your wall for it to collect data and then go nowhere. So I, back to what you were saying, with all this data and, and 
you know, filing uh, high low temps on a on a piece of paper that right. goes in a file cabinet and dies. It's like, so if we can get the data, there's the foundation, right? But then we can build logic behind that on the cloud without the expensive hardware and all that. So we can take the data and then we could say, okay, let's look for deviations in water usage and then and then let's trigger alarms. And, and that seems alarm, or alarm re, yeah. related, excuse me. And then it just grows from there. Okay, so then... So if we're doing that, what else can we do? And then we put all this logic in the cloud and on the back end and not in expensive equipment. And we continue to release and improve the experience of the user, yep. but make the data actionable. And, it, and, and you see some guys out there who are building um, software for the, you know big platforms, whatever it is, for the industry. Uh, it, and I think a challenge will be to get data into these platforms, whether you're trying to look at like feed conversion for the plants or whatever. Right. But if we can be that vehicle and work with those guys too, yep. where there's opportunities everywhere. Right. Yeah. I mean, collecting the data is the easiest part of the equation. We've been doing that for a long time, but making it usable and making it to where you can use it to make decisions. That's, that's the value. That's, yeah. that's the value. And for, for the, you know, we we operate in a pretty diverse um, system as far as all I can speak to is a swine business in that we run everything from people that have a closed system where they're farrowing the pigs, they're finishing the pigs, they're selling the pigs to people that are um, custom farrowing, people that are custom nursing, people that are custom finishing, everything in between um, from fairly small operations to fairly large but being able to tailor that data to the person that's receiving it, because what I want, what I want it for versus what my integrator might want it for are two right. different things. But the beautiful thing about it is if you do it right, you can both use the same platform. It's just, I just need lower level data. I need to know every day that, the temperature's right, the water's flowing, and the air's good. Versus the a sow unit, they need a right. lot more than And just the people that. that we're custom feeding for, they want to see they want to see that data over time and they want to see the the feed conversion. They want to see the water usage and that it's increasing. They want to see, you know, and they want to see that over a set of barns. And so their their need is larger, but if you build the platform right, you can cater to all those people. Right. So so all we need is an app, feed air water. Yep. Is is my finishing bar have power? Yeah. And I like that low level data, right? Yeah. And and these producers or these integrators want high level or I, I would say large data sets aggregated across their entire uh, oh. you know base of contract growers, whatever. And and then we can get into the sexy terms of big data and analytics yep. if we can get you that data. And so here we are, the vehicle, and then yeah, look for do some fancy analysis, what, whatever you're you're trying to do, and analyze tons of data across your entire system. In fact, you know, every day we collect millions of data points because we take temperature, water, humidity, power, ammonia, everything. We take we take measurements by the minute, by the sensor, across all our user base. And if you if we just assumed they were all part of like you one know, system, one system, that's some pretty powerful data. Yeah, for sure. How? What was the biggest struggle of starting uh, barn tools? Uh, was it getting farmers to kind of like adopt new technology? Because I know that can be a big struggle. Obviously, we're we're a little different because we're techie, but I know that a lot of farmers are skeptical. But I think like we touched on, you guys have made it really easy. If they just give you the chance, they will see that it's pretty easy to set up. It's dependable. It's no wiring, none of that stuff. So was that biggest challenge or is there something else that was Man, so hard? I, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, wow. We might need to take a break, go hit some whiskey or drink some whiskey <laughs> and come back. Uh, the biggest challenge i mean there's a lot of challenges in software development right and uh just getting an mvp minimum viable product launched yeah. 
And I mean, it, it starts as an idea, right? And then somehow you have to build it into a tangible product. Yeah. So an, an app and, and then uh, I, I would say the beginning challenges were more around building the actual product. Yep. Uh, not so much market adoption. Uh, yeah, because you started with basically a clean slate because there wasn't anybody doing what you were doing. Right. Um, and so, you know, we have lots of great ideas. Just, I mean, we can give you well, 100 great <laughs> ideas. Everybody has business yeah. ideas. It's the people who act D- on didn't it. Didn't Steve but, Jobs say it's about the ones you say no to? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but then you not you had to find... I mean, the last I checked, I don't, I don't know you that well, but I don't know if you're a software engineer. Mm, I, I, I would say probably no by definition. So you, you had to find people, not only that could do it, but actually got the vision and said, "Yeah, that's a good idea," and didn't say, "Oh, this is crazy. This ain't gonna work." Yeah, and when you build software, there's a whole, you know, I guess mindset out there or. or there's a whole world out there that just focuses on customer experience. And it's like, so what's the quickest, you know, what's the quickest path to value for you? So if I put the app on your phone, how do I get you immediately onboarded in value? And, and having this background really helped that. Right. So I I feel like I drove a lot of, of good value there and what do they want to see? And let's get them to see that fast Let's not go through a lengthy setup process and so on. Uh, and then, yeah, transferring that to the developers. I got to give Jim credit, too. Jim's a lineal thinker. He's yeah. my co-founder. Uh, he's process-oriented. I'm the type. It's like, let's jump off the cliff. Yeah. We'll put the airplane or the parachute together as we're falling. Jim brought the tools to do so. So I'm like, thank God, because yep. I probably forgot those. And, <laughs> and so we're like yeah. polar opposites, but we're a great team. Yep. And it we works. balance each other. It, that's, yeah, that's very how well. it works. Yeah, yeah that's well. good. Yeah, because if I if I had to describe uh, you to somebody that didn't know who you were, I would describe you as a guy that has three hamsters running in a two hamster cage. <laughs> Just because you you are like you're a dreamer. Well, no, but you. I think this is a little. I'll take it as a compliment. No, I think it is a little pot kettle though too. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I, I think that is. I think that could be why you know we we're kind of like minded, but. You know, you have the vision, but you also, it's really hard when you have the vision because you think everybody should be going as fast as you are. And that's why you got to have somebody like Jim, because Jim's like, we don't even have the motor to drive the wheel for the (laughs) hamsters. Uh, Yeah. So I guess I tend to make things sound a lot easier than they are. But what do you mean? We can just do this right now. And he brings a... He brings some good perspective, and yeah. So at its at its core, for somebody that isn't familiar, what does the what does the barn talk system look like? Sure. So we we built really at its core a replacement for your alarm system or your dialer. Okay, and and we did that because there's obviously issues, and I think you see issues every day. You know across this industry, across poultry and so on. And so what we did was we built a gateway. We knew one, we don't want to have to convince you to wire your barn or pay for it. Two, we don't want you to have to go to your local carrier, get a SIM card, a hotspot. Uh, phone lines are terrible. I mean, they're sunsetting. Uh, even the 3G hotspots you have are, are starting to sunset to make way for 5G. So those touch tone dialers you're used to are starting to stop working that starting to stop working. Uh, and, and so we looked at what were all the, what were all the problems with the current way? And then wanted to bring visibility as well as I uh, alluded to earlier. So we built a box, you plug it in, you have sensors, you go hang them. That's it. We didn't want you to do anything else. So as soon as you plug that box in, we find the nearest cell phone tower. If that cell phone tower goes down, let's say during a storm, we jump to the next one. doesn't matter the carrier. So it connects, you hang those probes, and right there on your phone, you can see there's my barn. My barn has power. My barn has temperature. I'm getting water readings. And, and it's like a monitoring and alarm system at its core. But we're collecting data to give you those, those values. And then, and then in the app, you can set parameters around those values 
to trigger alarms. Okay, if the yep. temperature goes over X, uh, call me. And, and by the way, I don't want to have to go to the barn anymore to set all that up and edit it. So here's my call tree. It's probably Torque Sawyer. We'll try Torque and Sawyer again before I have to get out of bed and Torque and Sawyer. And then maybe me. Yeah. And then and then being lower on the call tree, back to visibility, uh, and I say call tree, you know, a, a list of who the alarm's going to call in order until someone picks up. Uh, you're kind of blind down below. And usually the guys down below may, probably are like the barn owners, right? right. The hired hand starts. It's kind of like the totem pole, right? Well, he can see what alarms happened. He or she can see what alarms happened. And uh, so we bring that visibility, give you real-time data, and then allow you to uh, set triggers to be notified when things go wrong. Yeah, yeah, we can speak on that because we have... We have the barn talk system and two, well, three out of four of our barns. And just like Michael said, it is super easy to set up literally all the sensors that come with the gateway. You hang up the gateway, put it on a wall, finds the signal, put your sensors in your barn, and it's already pre-sunk up, download the app, and literally it starts reading information. It's literally that easy. That's yeah. what, like I said, they just made it so, so simple to do and it's so nice to see all that because our biggest problem, especially at my barn, I built my barn last year and the signal was just terrible that I had. And every time an agri alert or, you know, whatever system out there people have, I, it just would not take, it the, wouldn't password. take the password and I could never disarm the alarm. So it would just keep calling me and calling me and calling me and calling me. And if I was away, I could never go disarm the alarm because I wasn't here because I'd have to physically go up to the barn and disarm it. The other great thing that I love about it is like you were talking about, you can manage your, you know, uh, limits. your threshold, your limits. And the nice thing is you can have, there's three zones. Am I right about that? There's warning zone and then there's an emergency zone. Right. You could, you could just get a less invasive notification if it's trending the wrong yeah. way. Right. So like if you have, you know, you got an 85 to 90 and that's your warning zone, it's not really your emergency. And then, then like 90 to nine finds your emergency at the warning zone. It'll just send you a text message or an in-app notification, which is nice because I don't like getting called all the time, right? all the time. And yeah. with, with the old system, it didn't matter. You would just get it and get it and get it and get it and get it. And you can bring you know what you're getting called about. Right. And, and you got to know exactly. the zones. That doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you, hey, south room temperature. It just kind of says zone three. Yeah. So one of the, um, I'll give you a, a real, a real life story of, of one of the things that I love the most about our barn tool system is um, shortly after we put Sawyer's in, his was the first, we were at World Pork. And it was a nice day, nice hot day, like you would expect it to be. Yep. It's either pouring rain or it's blistering hot at World Pork Expo. And um, we were there, and I got an alarm call on my double site, which were the oldest pigs. And you on that on that system, you can set a high limit, and then you can set a critical. And if it hits the high limit, it'll look to the outside probe. And if the outside probe is hotter then it'll say, okay, it's fine. However, I had not set up the critical temperature from winter because in winter I always turn them down because there's no reason to have them set at 95 degrees in the wintertime because it's not going to be that hot. But in the summer I set them up and I hadn't and the, the critical was set at 90 degrees. And that thing started calling me and it would not take my password. And so it just called and called and called. Well, about 30 minutes later, Sawyer gets an alarm call from his barn tools alarm. And we hadn't set the high limits on it. We just we got it going. I think we literally just put it. Yeah. In and we were like, ago. Oh, this yeah. is awesome. You know? And it started, it got a text and then he got a call, but he was able to just go into the system and raise that high limit. And it was fine. Stop calling me. I just shut my phone off. In fact, well, I think I actually called, I think I actually called one of my neighbors neighbor and he came and just shut the alarm off. But then here we are and we spent the night. So here we are, we're away from home and we've got the alarm shut off because, um, it, we didn't want it calling us and I wasn't going to make him come back. I knew my curtain drops were set, but basically we were blind while we were gone. Yep. And that's one of the greatest things that I love about the system being, cloud-based is you can get in there 
And it's if, flexible. If you do something stupid like me, because it was my fault, I didn't set the alarm up, but still, I couldn't change it. And um, it wouldn't take my password. So anyway, um, that's one of the, you know, that's just a little bit of uh, life experience. Well, that's I guess just, you'd say. that's coming from us farmers. We just kind of give you guys perspective. We've used it. We enjoy the product. We've installed it. And it's just simple as like Michael is explaining, you know, it just, it's easy. And that story in itself right there is like a huge selling point on it. So, so you, you guys referenced password like four different yeah. times and a, Back to that customer experience piece, we even thought about passwords, and no one likes to enter passwords. If you're having me reset my password, I'm like, I just don't even want to use this anymore. This is terrible. So, Amen. So we even so we thought about things like that for customer experience, and and now you log in today, you put your phone number, and then it auto fills a one time text message mm -hmm. password and by the way side note best thing apple ever did <laughs> i don't I know if apple did apple invent i don't the OTP, know the i don't know password? but that that's i freaking love that but but the autofill i mean you can't get any yeah that's so nice than no that. it's yeah. awesome that is awesome and, and i know you torque you mentioned cloud uh one of the things that we try to overcome and still try to overcome is that you don't need broadband. You don't need, I mean, shout out to Elon Musk and, and Starlink, but you yeah. don't need it. Right. And if your cell phone doesn't work at your site, there's still probably a really solid chance we will. And yep. that's just because we're sending bits of data and not trying to watch yep. YouTube have a phone call or anything like that. Yeah, and the, I'll say that in the... Uh, at Sawyer's Barn, it's it's quite a ways off the road, and it and it's in a, just in an area where, for whatever reason, there's not good there's not good cellular coverage on the carrier that we used, and so when we put that alarm in there, we could not get a strong enough signal. It could get a strong enough signal to dial out, but it would not take the password. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess explain that a little bit because your system is not tied to one carrier, right? So. Because we provided the connectivity, what we did was we made our communication module or the chip inside uh, be carrier agnostic. Just find me the strongest cell signal. I don't care. And if and again, if something happens, I'll just switch to the next. So there's a bit of redundancy built in. Uh, you've had the phone lines be, you know, we've all experienced those phone lines on those dialers be somewhat yep. shoddy, unreliable, and so on. So. Uh, we built redundancy in, in how we connect right there. And then we do something called uh, the heartbeat. And, and what we do is every two minutes, pretty much what happens is we ping all our customers' boxes. And we say, hello, are you awake? Uh, is anyone home? And the box responds, yes, I'm awake. I'm still monitoring Torque and Sawyer's Barnes. Yep. And if it doesn't, then what we do is we trigger an alarm saying it's offline. And, and we've seen... You know, we've seen instances on other systems where, let's say, the water line breaks, fries the system itself, uh, whatever it is. Well, when the system dies, it can't tell you it's dead. Right. Well, ours, because it wouldn't respond to the, hello, are you still awake? Uh, on the, on our side, we'd say, uh oh, we didn't hear from Torx Barn. Right. And then we'd send you an alarm. So there's there's a fail safe there as well. Yeah, that's that's awesome because on all of our sites we had them set up to auto call once a week. Oh, for testing. So it would test call you once a week. Yep. And um, but really, if something happened to that in between, yeah, you wouldn't know it. It, it. You know, if you're in a situation where you've got when you've got you're halfway through a group, pigs are all fine, everything's going, you wouldn't give a second thought if you didn't hear from that alarm because it's only supposed to call you once a week right. and it's not and it could be dead and i've actually found that where i've had a i've had a phone line issue and i didn't know it until i don't know how long it'd been down because it just didn't call me and then i thought well that's weird it didn't call me the other two did but this one didn't and then that's when you find out yeah. oh yeah it hasn't worked for however long right and so that's that's great so how's been like how's the adoption rate been uh accepting barn tools like how fast have you know, people adopted it. Were you surprised by it? Were you, were your ex expectations lower than what you thought it'd be? You know, like how many people were going to adopt it? That's a great question. Uh, so the good thing is we aren't really, we don't really have to sell it. I mean, it just makes sense, right? And if you can cut your phone line, 
that maybe you're paying 60 bucks a month for. I mean, that's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's simple. So I would say our adoption has gone pretty well. I'm not, it's, it's a short sale cycle. Hey, we're at, we're switching your barn alarm. Yeah. And with something better. I, we we're talking to big integrators. They get it too. Let's get data from the barn. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, adoption has been good. What we're trying to figure out now as a company is maybe our best channel for distribution, whether, you know, is it online? Is it with these, uh, the QC supply and hog slats of the industry? Uh, is it referral? And so we're, we're doing, I'll call them channel experiments and then figuring out which one uh, we'll decide is a winner and then amplify. Uh, so, so adoption, pretty solid. Uh, how we're going to magnify that uh, is, is really the focus right now. Do you notice um, between species like, you know, the swine business versus the poultry business, have you had more interest in one versus the other? I mean, I would imagine the swine just because you have a few more connections and just more people that are, are aware of it there. But That's a great question. And, and swine, I, I'm better at talking swine, right? Uh, so what we found was, you know, we built this with a 2,400, 4,800 head finishing barn in mind. Uh, now we outfit sow farms and everything too, but that was kind of where we started our focus was. And then you, sw- you switch over to poultry and these guys are like, I, I have a 10 house site. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Okay. So, so poultry, we had to learn how to adopt to poultry because we want to be affordable, right? We're not trying to, we're not trying to break the bank, but then you have 10 barns on a site. Yep. And so I think for, for adoption, uh, both were very receptive to it, but we, we needed to maybe position it or come up with a different angle for poultry, given that these, these uh, poultry housing complexes are huge. Right. So that was probably our biggest challenge amongst switching species. Okay, so when you look into your crystal ball, what, what's next for, for barn tools? What's on the horizon? I think, Torque, if I had a crystal ball... I wouldn't have sold my hundred Bitcoin I had in twenty fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great. That's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, for barn tools, it's about catching up the industry. I mean, let's go back to like twenty eleven when Amazon was uh, a touting cloud computing and, and all that, and and then you have this wave of SaaS, so software as a service. Think of you know the subscription software you're paying for today. You have all these things that are coming out and and the egg industry especially so animal slow it, well it, animal egg is behind and but that's a connectivity problem yeah. right that's because okay you could build the coolest software for animal agriculture but how are you going to get it to the barn mm-hmm. and then how 100%. are you going to get stuff out of the barn yeah. and so it's about playing catch up mm-hmm. and, and once we do that uh then i think the opportunities from there are, I, I like to use the term, maybe we be, we're we trying to become a system of record, okay? So if we can, we're focusing, I know this seems very, uh, it seems very small and niche like today, the alarm system, but we're capturing barn environment data, right? And then if we can use that uh, and build on that and create other opportunities, I, I'm just you know, the futures, first we got to bring everyone up to speed. Right. And it's not just about connecting the barn. It's then it's cause you can connect a barn today, but with the controllers in there, you can't send stuff out still right. unless you modify or replace quality it. of data. Yeah. Or just getting those archaic, you know, controllers to, to connect. But, uh, so, so really, um, we bring everyone up to speed first and then, and we continue to build out sensors and, and you know measure different things and then use those to create efficiencies and, and eventually we can touch every department in uh, in a production system. So today maybe it's barn environments and and maybe one day we we do a collaboration or something and we're measuring feed and then uh-huh. from there you know so now your your feed ordering I've yep. 
goes through goes barn tools. Right, because we're measuring. Uh, mm-hmm. We've we've played with some technology uh, where we geofence the farm. Okay, and so the, we're using that for tracking who comes in and out for biosecurity purposes. But so, oh my gosh! So now we, so now we have. You know, the barn talk alarm system, we have the geofence. We can actually see if, if someone shows up at 3 a.m. like they said they did. Uh, but then we can re- record all these transactional records and maybe optimize delivery routes and so on. So let's just be really good at the alarm system and collecting data today and then naturally build on that and offer or build different solutions for different parts of animal agriculture. Boom. The goal the goal is for Torque to become Homer Simpson. <laughs> Have that one button. <laughs> Have one your button. phone. Just hit the yeah. barn tool. When I was uh, when I was overseeing field staff, um, my favorite time of the year was the first snow. The first snow on a Saturday. That's Be- specific. Loved a good snow on a Saturday because on Monday morning you knew that once some fieldman was going to call. They got to a barn at nine o'clock and there's no tracks. Yeah. So you know nobody's been there since Saturday. And then the phone call, and you know, it was always interesting. Uh, the excuses were amazing. Like I fully expected somebody to just finally say, you know, well, I, you know, I, I parachuted in. Yeah, I dropped I was in on a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, sure, got out. We got a rope ladder. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, that geofence, when you said that about geofencing, I was just thinking, oh, man, there's some guys that would hate that because when they didn't understand, you know, when it was geofence and you're trying to explain to somebody that uh, you knew that they weren't there and they're going to argue with you, oh, no, I was there. Well, well how are you here? Yeah, <laughs> I got proof you weren't, buddy. Here they're like, go. no, that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> So why are we even working on geofence? We just need a new snowstorm every day. Well, if you could order weather, (laughs) you got a relationship with the Chinese. They, they're working on that weather (laughs) manipulation. They might be able to do that. Well, I appreciate, I so appreciate you coming down because, uh, this is kind of a subject that's near and dear to our heart. As far as I feel like that within our industry, um, given the challenges that we have, that um, technology is going to help us in a lot of ways. Um, some that are known as we as, as what Barn Tools is doing, but in others that I don't think we even know. Um, we don't even know yet what what can change and how we can get more efficient and do a better job with less, basically. And so. Um, Welcome back, or you're welcome to come back anytime, and we're both looking forward to um, what's ahead for Barn Tools. Yeah, appreciate you coming on the show, Michael. Awesome name, by the way. (laughs) Barn Talk, I mean. Yeah. First, I thought you guys were, like, playing a joke on me, but... Uh, we just great minds think alike. That's so. right. Yeah, and That's it right. could it could have been bar talk, and it still we still would have loved it. Like we still would have been interested. I like that better. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, have a good week, guys. Bye.